I'm going to talk a bit about today is a bit of uh, the, the big picture of thinking about uh, the Anthropocene from a social ecological perspective. And then also thinking about, uh, I, I was a uh, CLA for the MA, but I've also been working a lot with IPBS. Uh, the, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, I think, some of the opportunities I think uh, I have kind of learned about from working in IPS that I think this research community can really contribute to and kind of at the frontiers of science and policy practice. So as, as I'm sure you're all aware, the, the Anthropocene is a hot topic of conversation. And it's really the point I think that's key for this group is that it's, it's recognizing that the Earth has become really a social ecological system where human, humanity shouldn't be thought of just as an impact or disturbance that needs to be managed but it's an integral part of ecosystem structure and function. And th this is, I think, a nice picture from Earl Ellis, who's, who's here, showing the, the different age of, of intensive use or intensive modification of ecosystem around the world. So saying that in many kind of places in the Anthropocene, or in the world, the, the, the sort of social ecological nature of local places is not new, but what's new is that at a global scale, these are all connected. And things that we formerly could think of Earth as something where social science and natural science could be relatively independent of one another, this is no longer the case. And I think just a couple of, um, a couple of key bits of the Anthropocene are the metabolism of humanity. So this, this is a, an estimate of energy use by people and if you look at the little uh, gray bit at the bottom, this, that's of biomass. And the other step at this top is everything else, but especially fossil fuel. And what this is basically just saying is that the use of fossil fuels hasn't decoupled people from the biosphere. It's actually enabled people to more strongly couple them to the biosphere and use more and more of the biosphere. And I think this is, uh, we sort of mask our, our connection to the biosphere with fossil fuels, but it's more that we've made it remote and distant. And a, a little cartoon that I like that I think really shows this, this is uh, an illustration in a cartoon form from, you can't read it there, but it's from estimates from Vlasov Smil of the biomass, not the species, but the biomass of the Earth's animals. This is mammals and actually reptiles. And what you can see from this is that humans and our human ecosystems completely dominate all these non-human animals. And so all the energy uh, and uh, transformation of the world is through our ecosystems with very little leftover from other stuff. So, so, oh, so that, that, that's sort of the, the classic kind of idea of the Anthropocene. So I'm going to think about, well, how can we think about the, in this more sociological way? And I'm going to talk about what we maybe could, we should be maybe thinking about, well, what kind of Anthropocene do we want to have? So in, there's also this project here, which I'm involved with, the Seeds of the Good Anthropocene, and in that, we're asking people what they think is a good Anthropocene, but today I'm gonna tell, tell you a bit what maybe I think is a good Anthropocene, but also I think it's something that doesn't just come out of nowhere, but is some broad, social, accepted ideas for what would be good. And then I'm gonna talk a bit about things in practice, to try and bring things down to earth. So, a good Anthropocene. So I think, uh, as you're probably all aware, sustainable, uh, the basic idea of sustainable development is that, that you have the economy embedded within society and embedded within the biosphere. And there's three pillars, however you want to talk about this. And it's usually some idea if there needs to be uh, social benefits, economic benefits, and some kind of uh, biospheric support to maintain these. And what I'm just going to I think that's widely accepted. I'm just going to push it a little bit. And if you think about something of saying this is, we want a fair, prosperous, sustainable planet, you can think about, well, what's fairness? And I think a very kind of simple way of thinking about fairness is children who are born, that, that where they're born doesn't completely determine, and who their parents are doesn't completely determine their life. Uh, prosperous is people having lots of opportunities to live a fulfilling life. And sustainable, the civilization that actually supports the biosphere, support of civilization rather than undercutting it. And so if, if we have some rough thing of that, you could say, well, you know, how are we doing now in the Anthropocene? How prosperous, fair, and sustainable we are? And I'm not going to take a long time on this because I think you know the answers. So I think I, I would argue that in some ways at the aggregate level, we're, we're fairly prosperous and we're doing good on becoming more prosperous. So this is, you know, human development index, which is combining life expectancy, uh, education, as well as income per person. And these are the 10 biggest countries in the world. And they're all improving. 
And if you look at, at gains actually in, in life expectancy and education, those are improving actually much faster than, than income is improving. But of course, these are really unevenly distributed. The world today is really unfair. This, this is a uh, graphing uh, Gini coefficients, which are a measure of one is one person has all the money and zero is everything is shared equally between people. And you can see a few countries up there. There's Sweden, where I'm from, the United States, the most unequal rich country, Brazil, an unequal middle income country like South Africa that is decreasing inequality, and the world, which is more unequal than the most unequal countries in the world. And, and th this is data from uh, consumption surveys from the World Bank, which kind of underestimates the rich end, but gets most people in the world. And, and looking at this data, this is from uh, uh, Branko Mlakovic, who's a big inequality guy, also pointing out that today, compared to when, say, Marx was writing in the 1870s, at that time, what class you were mattered the most for your life choices and what country you were born in mattered about one third. And today that's almost exactly reversed, that it's wh where you're born has a huge impact on, on your life chances, or at least your income, and, and much more than who your parents are within that country. So this is not fair. And if we think about uh, what's happening with this, this is now a little bit complicated graph, but this is along, this is for all the people in the world, their percentile in the world income distribution. So it's going from the poorest 5% all over the world to the richest 1% in China, the United States, everywhere. And this is what's happened to the world income over the last little bit, you know, before the financial crisis, but you know, these data lag. And what you see here is that what you'd hope, you'd have poor, pro-poor growth where poor people were getting richer and approaching the rich. But what you see is actually this, what you've probably all heard a lot about is, is the rich getting much richer the not so rich, which is actually a lot of people like in Europe and something, actually not doing so well. And then a lot of people in the, poor, in the poor are doing better, but the very poor are not doing well at all. But why I have two graphs here is this is really a lot due to China. And if you take out China, you see with these arrows, actually a lot, but from 90 to the 70th percentile, those people are actually getting worse. So you're not having this global convergence to wealth, you're actually having an increase in inequality with poverty is decreasing, but the rich are going away from everybody else. And so, we, and so that's income. And of course, income is, is, a, is a flow. And wealth is a stock. And the wealth has accumulated over time, and it's accumulated from lots of different activities uh, of, uh, of colonialism, of imperialism, and all sorts of unfairness that persists through time. And this, this is a map showing estimates of wealth. And wealth is really, really hard to estimate, but this is the best estimates there are from wealth from a, from a Swiss bank, because they're interested in the really rich people. And this is showing the, uh, both like uh, rich countries with different income levels. A and if you look at the individuals, though, it's basically that 1% of the world's population owns 50% of the world's wealth. So this isn't from... Uh, you know, the Marxists or something. This is from a Swiss bank. And 10% of the world's population, which maybe doesn't include all of us in here, but probably includes me and probably includes most of us, own 80% of, 80 or almost 90% of the world's wealth. So this is this sort of historical inequities that are sort of shaping the Anthropocene. And why this is important, at least for a first principle, is of course like the economic activity is a very good uh, proxy for environmental impact. So, uh, so I could put up figures of how this relates to environmental footprint, but basically it's the same, right? Uh, with some nuances. So and then what, what's, there, there's sort of uh, three big ways that people are kind of talking about inequal reducing inequality. One is the sort of pro-poor growth, which is sort of happening. That's what I was showing before, but it's really in China, and it's less elsewhere and not the world's uh, 5%. If you think about kind of global uh, equity, what we're doing for that, it's very, very small. So it's about $100 billion, which is not a small amount of money, but small relative to the world economy. It's less than 0.1% of the world economy is sort of redistributed around the world. And that compares to enriched countries that have some kind of welfare state, including the United States, the sort of average across them, is about 20% of GDP is presented on uh, benefiting the, the, the poor. So you could think if we wanted to kind of move towards a more equal world, you'd maybe want to increase that flow by a factor of 200, right? And then the, the, the 
what many economists would argue is that actually the best mechanism of getting poor people rich is for poor people to move from poor countries to rich countries. Um, but this is also very small and basically almost exactly the same amount of the global population as aid is of the, the global economy. About 0.1% of the global population moves per year. But the flows that even go back from those people to their countries. So, so they get rich living in rich countries, but it's four times bigger than these aid flows. But these are quite small compared to the problem we're facing. So what, what my point is here is that uh, inequality isn't going to reduce itself. And, and then, of course, as you're all aware, and we're coming up to Paris, we're, we're not doing so well with sustainability. I just think a, a kind of a depressing but, but important thing is if you look where the trajectory we're on, we're on the worst IPCC trajectory, which is like to six degrees in destruction. But of course, there's a lot more optimism now with countries giving suggestions that we could be more on this green line, but those are still not doing very well. And, and uh, th this is, I think, pretty sketchy uh, model, but it, just to kind of make a point, this is some economic model trying to estimate if climate change had big economic impacts, how big they would be. And, and these, these three graphs are a reduction of people living in extreme poverty under kind of uh, a business as usual today versus more aggressive or very aggressive poverty re reduction in blue versus if bad things happen with climate change. So the point being, if, if we're not addressing environmental issues, it could lose all these development gains that people have made and make things much worse while we're still already living in a very unequal world. And, and then, of course, that was just climate change. So this is you know, like a bit more my work, or with UNSI and, and Juan, Juan Rocha, is when we look around the world, you see all these different types of regime shifts. This is stuff we have from the regime shift database. And these regime shifts have been driven by all sorts of different processes. From the purple here, international or global scale things like climate change, regional scale things, and yellow local scale things. So all these abrupt ecological changes that can have big impacts on people's well-being and supply of ecosystem services are at least all to some extent driven by things that are, are far away from the people are, are, who are affected by them. And, and to a large extent, they can, they can manage these things, but you have to deal with these things at a global level. So, so just sort of how good is our Anthropocene right now? Well, it's, it's prosperous, at least to some extent. You know, sort of, if we averaged up all the, the wealth generated per year, it'd be $15,000 roughly per person per year. But it's not sustainable and it's not fair. And I, I think we need to think more about these interactions between these. This is like super sketchy, but it's like roughly kind of a conventional wisdom about what we know about the interactions between these things. Is prosperity, at least as it is now, has not been so good for sustainability, but sustainability under, underpins prosperity. Prosperity hasn't been so good for fairness. It's sort of inequality has driven fairness, but fairness seems to be important for sustainability. And we don't really know how fairness and prosperity and sustainability don't all work with one another. But I think this is what we much more need to understand about the world in a bit more detail for how to think about uh, a, the world as a social ecological system. So uh, that's my big picture. And I'm going to come back to that at the end. And so what, one of the other things that, that I've been involved with now is the uh, IPBS. And I know many people in the room, I've talked to many of you about it. Um, so IPBS is, for those who don't know, is kind of the IPCC for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. It was founded a few years ago. It started a few thematic assessments and is now starting these regional assessments and a, a bunch of, a lot of South Africans are involved in the African assessment. And then it's, but it's also got a very strong focus on capacity building, which unlike the IPCC, and a strong focus on indigenous and local knowledge. And uh, I would say I think they, they kind of haven't had the best planning on these things. But I think this is really something not where I'd say that people from here should necessarily be involved in IPS, but from when I've been involved in IPS, I think there's huge opportunities for this community to affect these the discussions and have a really positive impact on not IPBS per se, but how people are thinking about ecosystem services and biodiversity around the world. And this is opportunities to do this via IPBS or in IPBS related activities in nations or in training. So these are some things that I think are really missing right now in IPBS, which I think this community can contribute to. So one of them is that IPBS is doing these super large scale assessments of like the Americas, of Europe and Central Asia, all of Africa. 
And yet a lot of our expertise is at local based case studies. And we as a community, I think, really need to go, it's like, how can we move from local cases to more regional insights, keeping the diversity and the specificity in there? And I, I just put this up here. This is something I've been working on with Juan Rocha for the Arctic Council, another assessment of where we've tried to look at resilience across the Arctic, which is very little research. It's very scattered people, very fragmented research community. But we tried to go by scaling up a bunch of case study. We tried to look, we applied a consistent resilience framework to 20 different social ecological case studies and tried to see what we could see about this. And what, what we found was very much that self-organization was the key thing to give people the ability to have resilience or transformation. Governments of countries in the Arctic are very interested in building resilience in the Arctic, but basically what are the, what's the things that have been destroying resilience and ability to self-organize? It's colonialism by those very same countries. And you know, colonialism in the past, but also colonial legacy today and how things are run, they're basically trying to standardize, homogenize, and prevent local people from self-organizing. So this is something, by doing this, we, we've got a, a message to the Arctic Council, both that, like, or these nations, that by maybe backing off a little bit, they can achieve their goals. And so say just a concrete example of this, is the Canadian government is concerned about food security in the Arctic. So rather than promote hunting of seals and other things that are more indigenous, traditional life ways, the government wants to give like people kind of vouchers and stuff to buy stuff, imported food at the supermarket. So it's like decoupling people from the landscape. So that's completely opposite to what this kind of stuff says. And, and th this kind of thing is also sort of identifying that many of the things that matter for understanding social ecological resilience in the Arctic are not being monitored for the Arctic Council. So even though we only have partial knowledge, we can hopefully improve the next set of assessment and thinking about it in the Arctic by combining our knowledge and identifying some of these key features of things that are at least maybe not optimal things, but at least stop doing bad things and improving the evidence base for the policies that they're doing. And I think this is something that, not that this is so great, but this is the kind of thing that we really need to be doing to move social ecological insights up to the regional level. This, this is sort of this abstract policy cycle. And why I'm putting, this, so this is this idea that's an idealization, not really matching reality, but that there's different phases in policy creation that people kind of craft policies, they implement them, they evaluate them, there's some agenda setting of describing policies. And, and why I think this is useful, this is something that we're using in IPBS, but basically, this is a little bit unfair, but it's basically almost all the tools and models that people are developing from ecology are in this blue quadrant of design. So they're saying there, there, there's some decision makers and we're gonna help them make a decision. And as a lot of people here have been talking about, I was, on, I was in the uh, uh, panel where people were talking about uh, collaboration the other day. A lot of the work we do is about agenda setting, review and learning. And these are kind of missing from this toolbox. And, and we, we really, I think as a community, need to kind of make our approaches tractable and visible to these types of things. I was basically uh, in IPBS desperately looking for any kind of model that existed that included indigenous knowledge in it. And I found, I think, kind of two or three that did in some way. But, but this is something where I think uh, there's huge opportunities to fill in these things. So just gonna go through this. So the, the, in this top corner, I said where most of these models fit, like this is sort of like, a, I know there's natural capital people here that they've, they've used their models in some of these other phases, but the models are really focused on making decisions. Even like uh, uh, people say in Australia are focusing on the Center for Environmental Decisions and it's sort of not thinking about well, who's making this decision, what system is things being decided on, who's involved in it, which are all these other sides. Then just, so there's this real need to use models and scenarios as platforms for dialogue and we do this a lot, but we, this, this stuff isn't so visible. And I think there needs to be more connections between the kind of quantitative and the qualitative. To more formally think about integrating, comparing, and uh, contrasting case studies or, or different types of analysis to one another to improve learning, to evaluate what works, what's complementarity or not. I think that's something we can really do in this community as well, is bring together different case studies, different methods, and say what are their comparative strengths and weaknesses. And then finally up here in the tactical models, what, what I really mean here is that, um, say if you're a municipality, how do you decide what you're gonna do? I think this is what was being talked about yesterday by, by, by Deborah Rogers, is that we, we also need to develop these kind of very simple 
models that people can use in very complex local places to help them make better decisions in a practical and efficient way. And that's, I think, something we also don't do so much. So uh, an another thing I'll come, I think, that's really key in here is this um, cascades versus social ecological feedbacks. So this is the, the sort of T cascade, which presents a very, this is the dominant way people think about ecosystem services. Even when they sort of know better, this is the way it's often operationalized, is that there's some nature and it flows to people. Rather than thinking about this kind of that, there's all these dynamic interactions determining access, building infrastructure, uh, changes in values that determine what people use and how they transform ecosystems. So this uh, on, on the right here is a paper that tries to kind of integrate the, the sort of more TB framework with uh, a framework from Belinda Reyes and others uh, in a more social ecological way. But I think we need much more of this of kind of operationalizing these social ecological frameworks so we can get a handle on these social ecological interactions. And I know like in my work I've had very much like snapshotty stuff, but we really need to get better at making these social ecological interactions visible to people to uh, empower local, local planners and organizers to think about these softer and more social sites about, say, uh, maintaining green commons, thinking about access and infrastructure to ecosystem services, and the values that are, that are providing stewardship, or why people are investing in stewardship to keep ecosystem services around, and more managing this whole process rather than thinking of just a narrow supply chain. And then uh, back to ecological knowledge. I, I think there, there's a huge opportunity to kind of use models or platforms like Invest, but also like other stuff, and, and link them to this work that, that's been done about thinking about di bridging different knowledge systems. So this is this multiple evidence base uh, idea from Maria Tango and other people, a lot of whom are here, about how you can, can bring together uh, different types of knowledge in, in an integrated way to think, uh, to think about things. And, and this, wh where a lot of the work that's been done on this is very much dialogue driven or thinking about narratives, but this kind of bringing things together is one of the things that models are very good at, good at and they're used very widely. But there's, and I, I know myself I've done this of use, using participatory modeling with, with indigenous people, but there's no, this kind of thinking about uh, frameworks for bringing multiple knowledge systems together to think about modeling ecosystem services is something that actually doesn't exist as something you could find that on the internet. And I think there needs to be, this is like something that IPS says it really wants to do stuff with indigenous and local knowledge and there's sort of nothing lying around there that's integrated with other ways that people are doing ecosystem services. So I think this integration is something that this community is, could easily do. It's just sort of sitting there. I think there's huge opportunities to do this. Um, and I think, you know, not to say that there's one right way of doing it, but to move towards doing this better and getting it into practice. Uh, so uh, a, a f final one for this is uh, I, I do a lot of work with scenario planning and IPBS is interested in developing uh, scenarios and I'm, I'm very very worried that they're gonna copy IPCC scenarios which I think would be a total disaster because ecosystem services and biodiversity aren't well mixed around the entire world in a year like carbon dioxide is. But scenarios are really useful just like models for, for bringing together different ideas, different models and data into one place to focus comparative analysis by giving people a set of stories or a set of things that they can use in their different analyses to compare them to one another and to bridge between, especially between uh, policy and practice to kind of focus discussion. And so like scenarios are really useful to have, but I think this is that in this community, I know I've done it and lots of other people here have done local scenario cases, but that, that community is very fragmented. That there's, I think we've often reinvented the wheel. There's not kind of a clear uh, kind of best practices for how to do these kind of scenarios, how to, how to do them differently in different contexts. And, and I think there's a failure in us too to kind of link these to more broader scale uh, global scenarios. So something that, that Steve was talking about, but I think this community needs to kind of um, think about how it can bring its expertise together and link it to these global scale processes so we can understand how local diversity matters to these global scale things and how these global scale things land in the local. So again, I just sort of wrap up then. So I'm thinking like, 
I think in PECS we should be thinking much more about uh, what kind of Anthropocene we could want, and we want to be thinking about these big uh, processes. I think there's a lot of sort of, uh, in the Earth System Science discussion of the Anthropocene, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, biogeochemical flows and metabolism. And now there's a, a whole bunch of environmental humanities people talking about the Anthropocene in terms of values and ideas. But I think there's still a lot of missing empirical and, and practical research on things like what are the social ecological dimensions, what are the connections, the feedbacks that are driven by migration, by people moving around the world and bringing ideas with them into new places, uh, old bringing species with them, changing landscapes, sending money and ideas back to their own countries. What is the impact of financial flows? It's something that Victor Glass is here has worked on a bunch. Uh, both official and illicit financial flows, which are illicit financial flows are about the same size as global aid. They're about, they're something like, who knows, but they're, they're some big chunk of the world economy. And while they're often framed as a corruption com uh, problem, it's a corruption problem that's mostly in rich countries because most of these benefits go to banks in rich countries. Uh, and then uh, thinking about the historical legacies of colonialism that have built up this wealth pattern in the world and all those legacies that persist today and how real world political economy actually shapes the world versus kind of um, uh, simplified models uh, of, from economics. So say like a lot, a lot of times people think about things like the median voter theory, which comes from economics, but that the government represents public interest, which people have repeatedly, kind of like the environmental acoustics term, people have repeatedly shown to be false, but people still keep using it. So I think this is kind of like, we need to kind of engage with this, not as something as critique, but how is this actually something we can do to create more positive futures? And then I think th this is key of bringing these things together. It's like in this Anthropocene, if we can orient towards what we at least can propose as good Anthropocene, what, what are ways and steps we can move towards those types of futures? What are feedbacks we can break? What are new feedbacks we can create that start steering the planet away from the sort of bad Anthropocene towards a more positive future? And then I think in a more practical way, I think practical things to do some of that, there's this big global project of IPBS. It's going to be doing all these assessment, all this capacity building. It's at the very least a way to leverage our research to reach a broader audience, especially in, in policy. And at worst, it's a bunch of questions that are being raised that we can use to improve our research to make it more policy relevant and engage with different groups. But by, I think, trying to integrate our insights into, into new frameworks, models, and scenarios. And so I'm just going to end with one thing. So, so I mentioned before I'm working with this, lots of people here on the Seeds of the Good Anthropocene project. And, and I think that that's got a bunch of values, I think, that I think are really important for both these things of thinking about PECs and thinking about the Anthropocene. I think we really need to embrace pluralism of not, not be thinking there's like one right uh, conceptual framework, but also be thinking about reality. And I, I like this sort of Ostrom's law, which is sort of saying like contrary, you know, Eleanor Ostrom kind of won the Nobel Prize for showing the tragedy of the commons, which kind of works fantastic in theory, doesn't actually happen all the time in practice. And so her law is saying we should actually look at what happens empirically in the world and find, find these examples of good things, even if they don't fit existing theory and people are not behaving rationally, what can we learn from that to improve our theories rather than miss them because we got on theoretical blinders. I think Elena Bennett mentioned yesterday in her talk about, about uh, William Gibson, and I think this is the same kind of idea that we should be looking for novelty in the world, of not just the, the dominant factors, but also these kind of fringe ideas or, or even, even uh, uh, crazy ideas. Uh, this kind of goes with the, the, the talk about the, the street science, it, is that uh, we know that, that what, what's going to be big tomorrow is small. Some of the things are going to be small today, and we should be trying to find the sort of seeds that we want to nurture to build a good future. So we should be looking for this novelty out in the world. And then uh, finally, uh, I, I think we need some kind of uh, radicalism. This is a quote from a, a Marxist critical theorist Mackenzie work. Uh, he's sort of arguing that for the Anthropocene, that's, he's arguing for social sciences, but I would say for all of us, that we need to find new ancestors, that we need to kind of look for different intellectual lineages to bring up in our work to increase our pluralism, that the old ones have produced this sort of, are producing this bad Anthropocene. We maybe don't need to throw them away, but we at least need to get new ones to kind of think about new ways of thinking about the Anthropocene. And so in his book, which is, uh, I thought was kind of very interesting, is Theory for the Anthropocene, he, he kind of talks about uh, 
Bogdanovich, which was a, a Russian early system theorist who was killed by Stalin. Uh, Donna Haraway, who's a cyber anthropologist, all interested in hybrids, and Kim Stanley Robinson, who's an ecological science fiction writer. So I think this is kind of thing we should be thinking about or exploring alternate traditions, people, thinkers, to say, well, what can we learn from alternate ways that people thought in the past to help us envision new futures? So with that, thanks very much. <laughs>